Folks, welcome to Scottsdale. Joined here by a dear friend and a really important cat in the, music, in the history of the musical lineage of this country, Jerry Cortez. Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks, Jake. Great to be here in Scottsdale, Arizona. So <laughs> we know about Round Table Pizza. Do you remember the first time you were on a record date in the studio? First record date for Jerry Cortez. You know, that's... That's around that same time. That was like a that I remember. Gosh, I mean, like a like like session. Yeah, where someone was like, yeah, I, yeah. I yeah. mean, not not a jingle, not a right. not, you know. Yeah, but it like, was probably with Carla uh, Piper, this woman that that did the round table pizza commercial. Uh, she's the one who hired me for that, and right. the two of us sang uh, uh, Marvin Gaye and and Tammy Terrell's parts, and, it, and it, we changed the song. Um, um, it takes two, baby. To uh, lunch it for takes two. two, babe. Yeah, lunch for two. Yeah, that was round table. Yeah. yeah, that was round table pizza commercial, and I used to like their pizza too. Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so she hired me for that, and then it was like a we, chain or something. Round table. Was yeah, 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 it's yeah, uh, yeah. Ca California anyway, right. for sure. Bay Area did well there. Um, they're still around too, but after that, she uh, we we hit it off, and she hired me to come play on her album. And I played guitar and bass, and my brother was the drummer. And I think it's called like, it has a title like Music in My Mind or Music on My Mind, something like that. And, uh, you know, just an album that came out. I don't think it got a lot of airplay or anything like that, but it sure was fun. And it was at a great recording studio. 75, basically? No, no, it was a little later than that. It was like 1980. Yeah, so if I'm that, digging through the records, that was pressed as an LP? It was. Wow. It was definitely pressed as an LP. Wow. And, and the keyboard player was a... a a legend at the time. His name was Don Haas, and he was an older guy. He's old enough to be my grandfather, absolutely. Um, Any relation I, to Wendy or no? Not that I know of, but I, same I'm not spelling sure. though. Yeah, same same. Spelling, you told yeah. me, dude. Any yeah. shaman cat was like, if whoever if whoever they studied with, it was most likely Don Haas. Yeah, yeah, definitely Don Haas. And uh, yeah, when Frank Sinatra came to town, like Circle Star or something like that, he go, I I need Don Haas to play piano. That's right. So that's the kind of caliber he was. And here I was, like a twenty, you know, twenty-four year old or something, just kind of like, what? Who's this guy? Where? Who's he playing with? So what you, am I doing was, here? Was it an <laughs> album of original tunes? What was your yeah, role? Yeah, it was all it was all original. I just a session player. To, I played acoustic and electric guitars, and uh, and then I, I played bass. I did all the bass guitar stuff as well. So um, it was fun. W mostly first takes, like everybody hitting at the same time. For the most part, yeah. And no overdubbing. Uh, there was some overdubs, yeah, because I. I, I would play bass and drums with my brother, and Don was playing piano. The three of us would play as a piano trio, and then wow, um, and then I overdubbed acoustic guitar or or electric or both. And your brother so, yeah, and plenty of overdubs. You feel like there are spots in the record where that accentuate that that stands out. The trio playing too. Do you stretch out, or is it mainly like two three minute tunes? Oh, it's 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 kind of short tunes. I mean, there's probably some four or five minutes. She, there's one song I remember that was kind of an excursion. Excursion. For, yeah, yeah. And it went on for a, a little bit. It might have been been a, a medley of ideas and stuff, and it went through a lot of different uh, tempo changes and stuff like that. So yeah, hip. It was kind of a thing. So hip. Then. Did you guys get to perform live, or was that just a, a pet project? It was just kind of a pet project for her, and then we, I, my brother and I also played 
some casual gigs here, here and there with her, you know, different clubs and stuff like that. And that, that was fun too. So when was your, so knowing that you were born in Santa Clara, I believe that in the early bands that you were in pre city section, all that stuff. Yeah. Were you down playing the catalyst? I mean, Neil Young played down there. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, can you talk James about James Brown Santa did too. Rolling Stones played the catalyst. Did, un, so under the radar. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, I love it. Dude. Yeah. And they used to do that. And, and catalyst wasn't the only kind of club like that. They, but they used to go, go around the country checking out new material and see how it went over, you know? And uh, that was kind of a really smart thing to do for them. And they loved playing those kind of places too, you know? And, and they uh, totally unannounced, you'd have to hear about it, boom, it's, in an hour, the Rolling Stones are hitting the stage. What? <laughs> I live an hour away. <laughs> Maybe right. I could make it kind of thing, you know? Uh, so, but yeah, um, Catalyst was a wonderful place to play. And I, I don't even know if it's still around. I, I want to say that it is, but I could be wrong about that. You don't, you're not familiar with the, the brothers uh, Catfish and Dallas Hodge, are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, so Dallas sure. and I just did connected did a couple of interviews, and he had a band out in Santa Fe in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. So this is like, this is prime Cor Cortez time. Yeah. Did you have a band that you did regional touring with down in Santa Cruz? Uh, yeah, I, I played uh, for a long, just right out of high school. Yeah. Um, for the most part. You told I, your mom, she's like, what are you going to do? You're like, I'm just going to play the guitar. Yeah, I'm going to play guitar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's what I've done ever since, you know. Um, and I, my brother and I were in a band. My brother was in the band first. There was a band from San Jose called the Garcia Brothers. And it was two brothers that played guitar and bass. And um, they both were kind of multi-instrumentalists as well. They played, they dabbled in keyboards. And, and uh, one of them... Uh, one of the guys also played saxophone as well. One of the brothers, and he's a great bass player. And uh, it was like an R and B rock. Yeah, band yeah, R and B. Yeah. Definitely, that's exactly what it was. It was rock stuff. We, we might have even done a Tower song or two here. And I bet there you did. Once in a while back then, you know, I can't remember for sure. If we did, it was probably something like "You're Still a Young Man." I don't remember doing "What Is Hip" or anything like that. Real horde, you know, hit it hard horn thing. But maybe "You're Still a Young Man" or something like that. I can't remember for sure. But we were definitely fans of Tower Power, that's for sure. Um, but anyway, a, a year later, I joined the band, and it was a five-piece band. It was two, so there was two sets of brothers. And uh, we, we thought about changing the name, but the, at the time, the band was in, within that circle. We're already somewhat established, so we said, just leave well enough alone. People know who the band is. We don't care if our name's on there, too, you know? And so, but um, those are the places where the people were like, we don't want we, we don't want to hear covers. We want to hear your own stuff. Yeah, exactly. And we were we played a lot of original stuff, you know, and, and we would play some covers here and there, but most of the time we would play covers back then. Club owners would go, Hey, stop playing that crap, man. We want we, we want to hear your stuff. And I was like, Yeah, I mean that would it's hard to imagine that happening now. Well, you know? I wonder <laughs> if you what is being that you've basically been in the in the music racket, in the biz for your whole life. Yeah. Why do you think um, I mean, it's easy to say the bean counters came in, but it's also like people's ears, like as opposed to like a club owner who was a true music fan to say, yeah. we want to start new vocabulary. We want to start new new blood. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, you know that why do, why do you what's your theory on that? Why have we gotten so conformist in that sense? Well, you know, I think uh... not that not that you know you were playing a gig like. But you were playing, you were making good bread. Yeah, we were making decent bread. And, and we, uh, you know, the thing was, is there were a multitude of clubs that really supported live music and original music by local bands. You know, bands that did not have record deals. Right. And, you know, were working at that for sure. But, you know, hadn't really arrived yet. You know, had no hits. But in, another thing that was pretty cool the fans that came out to hear, not just our band, but all these other bands, like there was a band called Poker Face. They were, they were very much like a, a Dewey Brothers Eagles kind of band. And right. they were really Poker good. Face. Poker Face, they were an excellent band. One of my favorites was a band called um, Uncle Rainbow. And they were on the level of Steely Dan. I'm, I'm not kidding. No way. Yeah, they had two keyboard players, both, uh, a guy named Little John Sanders, you know, you, I don't know if you know John oh. Lee Sanders. Great, you should, there's a guy you should. John know. Lee, yeah, dude, he's, John Lee, he's man. A bad cat, boy. man. Yeah, they, and Holy so they came shit. through Dallas and they, they landed in the Bay Area and they worked a lot. But yeah, and they covered kind of Steely Dan stuff, plus they did their own thing, you know. So yeah, that was a really excellent band. Brent Bourgeois was the other keyboard player and a songwriter. 
and uh, just a wonderful band. But you, club yeah. owners at that time were, they, they believed that humanity would come see original music. Oh yeah, they right? definitely did. And, and they did. And then, yeah. what, <laughs> and so that, we had a good three or four year streak, you know, from the time that I started doing that. Like that was probably, uh, I want to say, like summer of 76 or something mm. like that, I think, yeah. And up until about 1977 or so, when disco really was hitting it hard, and then things changed. Because we would go into these places and we would dress however we wanted. We could have, we'd get up there with holy t-shirts on, you know. And in fact, that was even encouraged, you know. Right. Kind of grungy. Punk, kind of look, yeah. like Almost, yeah. you know, we weren't punks. No, 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 not really. That. I mean, but like it but was like the attitude. Yeah, exact, attitude, it was a punk exactly, attitude exactly, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so it was. It was just a wonderful time, yeah. you know. And like I said, the fans would come to our shows and they would sing our songs. They right, the and you lyrics. didn't even have a record out. Yeah, we didn't even have a record out. It was just people. So, how do you guys know the lyrics to these songs? I don't even know the lyrics. You know, I'm not. I'm not you know, I'm this. I'm not singing the song. I hear the song every night, but I. I couldn't sing these lyrics. <laughs> Tell so, talk anyway. to the audience, Jerry. It's so so therapeutic to talk to you, man. Talk to the audience about, um, you know, the the tonal qualities of playing a lot of acoustic music, like you did with Jesse Colin Young, and more electrified stuff uh, in any amalgamation in any band you've been in. I mean, what are the um, for you? What are the aside from the amplification? Is, mm -hmm. is the touch? Uh, the, how do you? What's different about it? Uh, for me, it's kind of huge, and the reason I say that is, I haven't done like playing acoustic music on a regular basis in a really long time. Um, last time probably was Jesse. You know, you did I, it for a long time. I did it though. for a long time with him, but um, but you know, I so just, you're not going. You're, I mean, like you guys, obviously, are, it's not like no. In this in the studio, which is which has been a really a big thrill for me is that I've done, well, I've done um, three studio albums and a live album. The three studio albums, there's acoustic guitar, and not just a six-string acoustic, but a 12-string acoustic guitar. Um, and let's see, what wow. else? Oh, was there something else in there? Yeah, you know, 12-string acoustic and an electric acoustic, and then another guitar that was tuned like in a Nashville tuning where the, all the lower strings were actually tuned the same as the higher strings, but it was like a, kind, of, kind of like it's called a Nashville tuning. It gets this really glassy kind of sound. Anyway, so, hmm. uh, so there's acoustic guitar on all those albums, and it started out with we were um, finishing overdubbing some electric on, on this song, and, and Emilio, <laughs> the leader of the band, is kind of pacing around the control room where I was recording electric guitar, and he goes, this song needs something. It needs some, he was about to say, like, it needs a shaker. Like, I, I could, we could tell. It Joe Vanelli yeah. was in the room, too. He was engineering and co-producing this, so it was just the three of us. He goes, this song needs, a, and Joe and I, I'm not kidding, said in unison, acoustic guitar. And he goes, <sighs> and Emilio stops and goes, we could do that? You know, because there's never been an acoustic guitar on a Tower of Power album. So for me, it's, wow. a, it's a great honor in the last that three. That is awesome. Yeah, in the last three. What's albums. the name of the tune? Well, there's several. Um, so now there's been several incorporated. I oh, mean, yeah, in the but it, but in the live performance, you're not playing the. Acoustic. No, not a play. You know, it's and it's and it's sitting back in in the mix. It's not meant to. Oh, listen to that acoustic guitar. It's the textural thing. So it is kind of like a melodic shaker. You know, it's strumming kind of things. And then I did another song on one of Doc's ballad. Uh, Love Must Be Precious and Kind, something mm. like that. We, on the uh, first album I did with the band, Soul Side of Town, and it's a beautiful ballad, and I played a nylon string classical guitar, and I played lead fills plus rhythm stuff, and that just never happened on him. And, and that was a big, big part of Joe's and my influence, I guess you could say, because I love to play acoustic guitar, and, and we, we sold the idea to Emilio. I feel like, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, when, you know, when you're off the road, maybe you'll lean more into the acoustic playing. You're going to live in a mass now? Oh, or? yeah, I definitely do. In fact, yeah. I'm, I'm already um, working on... Yeah, you're already in it. Yeah, I'm already working on playing a couple of different places just Good. by myself. That's you know, awesome. Singing and playing, just for, just for the fun of it, you know, to get, get out there and do Dude, you got to do it, it'll, it, man. It'll definitely stretch Keeps my, your soul together. Oh, totally, man. It'll, it'll challenge me because I'm not used to playing by myself, you know. But I do love to do it. And I've done it for small gatherings and stuff, but it'd be fun to go out there and, and do it in front of the public. You know? I want you to tell me your favorite 
We, he he left us tragically. Your favorite Nate Ginsburg story. Oh, poor Nate. Yeah, my my loving Nate. I, I love that man. I, I think about him all the time. <laughs> yeah, I miss Nate. Uh, he was. I mean, I, I I don't think he's been on so much crazy badass stuff. Oh, I know. As a player, <laughs> and then you know, but um, what's what's in fifty years when somebody's like finding a Jump Street album or like you know. <laughs> Freaking Herbie album. Who yeah, was this guy? Grand Central Station. Yeah, right. Who was this Soul guy? Train. You know, the only white guy in the whole studio. You know, <laughs> and that Nate is sick. Just totally dude. funking it up, man. Oh man. oh man. Yeah, Nate. Nate was the best. Uh, well, you know, I can't think of any one particular. What's the vibe? Nate yeah, yeah. Story, the essence. You, you know, but the one thing about him is he, um, his energy was very childlike, and and he reminded me very much of my own older brother. Um, so it was, it was such a comfortable thing to be around Nate because he reminded me of family. So You're the drummer, I, your brother, the drummer. Yeah, my brother's a drummer, Robin Cortez. Yeah, and Nate, their personalities were very similar. Um, they just had this. They were always just hyper excited about the littlest things, even. So uh, right, right. <laughs> but it's just so. Oh wow, are those brown M and M's. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. You know, so it's just stuff like that, and and it's just infectious. You know. And that's the one thing I, I really miss about, and I, I will continue to miss about Nate, was his childlike um, attitude towards, towards life, you know, and just unconditional love for everything around him, wow. it seemed like, you know, he, that's, that, and my brother's like that, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit more jaded myself, but those guys were, were just so fresh all the time, you know. Um, it's beautiful. I, I rest in peace, Nate Ginsburg. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, did you love you, Nate? <laughs> definitely. Did you? Um, did you know Margin was Margin when he was playing with Santana, and you were seventeen, or it was only after the fact you're like, oh wow, you were in Santana's band. You well, saw him was, at the day on the green. I was nineteen, so nineteen I'm two nine, years older. <laughs> so you saw him, and he was seven. You're two years old. He was seventeen playing with yeah, Santana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. And, day uh, on the green. Yeah. It, and, you know, I think he might have been. Well, wait, wait let, let me see. That was, uh, I think it was 78. So I, I, was, I was actually already, uh, I was 22 by then. So he was 20. Yeah, so I mean, close enough. So he was a little bit older than that. But he had already been in Santana for a little bit. But no, I didn't know, I didn't know who he was back then uh, when I saw him in 1978 on Day in the Green. And that day was Eddie Muddy. Mm -hmm. And I remember I played with the bass player for a few years back then named Tim Sheridan. And I remember when I started playing with him in 1980, I said, hey man, I saw you, saw, you, saw you at Day in the Green a couple years ago. And he goes, oh, you saw that show? I said, what do you mean? He goes, first song, my bass rig just blows up. Like, didn't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, it was the worst. He goes, here I am, I'm at home. You know, I'm playing, I, I, you know. Hometown I, show. He grew up in Burlingame, you know, we're right. in Oakland, you know. So, and here he goes, first song, boom, no, no bass. And, so and he's they, hanging on to that still, and yeah, nobody even noticed. Nobody even noticed. Yeah, yeah. Or do you think that musicians, I mean, as I've gotten, I've been hanging with my peers a lot coming out of COVID, yeah. and just sort of, you know, just really, vibe, you know, feeling the music hard, and yeah. uh, you guys think you're your own worst enemy sometimes, being that you come off the stage, maybe you were in your younger years, but they come off the stage, even if the crowd had a great time, totally... <laughs> absorbed in their imperfections and it's like imperfection is perfection you want to riff on that yeah oh yeah no i, I know what you mean there's yeah. a there's been I, I know case in point i've just just made me think of uh uh when i worked with jesse he was uh he was quite the perfectionist you know um and there were times especially when it was just the two of us because i did play in um at one time, when I first joined Jesse, was the Youngbloods. Right. Yeah, and then Perper uh, was in that band. Yeah, he was, and then Perper kept saying, "Hey, we got to step it up here. It's, it's the '80s, you know. Put that acoustic guitar down. It's, it's rock." Yeah, know? right. And then that lasted all, literally like two or three shows, and then Jesse did you have like said, huge amps? Screw, and he's like, "Said screw <laughs> this. I, I want to play guitar. Wow. And I want to get back to acoustic music. Jerry, you interested?" Yeah, the rest of you could go. I mean, it wasn't, it didn't happen exactly like that, but that's pretty much what happened. Uh, but anyway, could he have played lead elect? I mean, it seems like he could have done anything he wanted. He just, oh yeah, he he could play lead as well. But I was, I'm going to finish riffing on. Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. riffing, riffing. <laughs> but you, 
<laughs> we would finish the song. It would just be the two of us. We'd be playing somewhere little, just like a little tiny place in um, Davis. There was this place called the Palms. Oh, I love and it. And it held, it held like maybe 100 people, you know, and they're all just kind of sitting. They're like sitting amongst us, you know. They're like right there with us. And I remember there was this one time it has tiny, tiny little stage, but they're just like right there with us, you know. And uh, Cloud's going, ah, yeah. and Jesse turns to me and he goes, hey, you know, we really got to work on that ending. You know, he's like, he's like talking to me like we're at a rehearsal, you know? It's right. like, oh, this, it's showtime, baby. I mean, come on. <laughs> why, would you, why would you bring that up now? He we, is a classic We've had a perfectly hat. good night here, you know? Why are you going off on me like this, you know? Like right now, at this moment, exactly. you know? Why, bring it up, after, you know, at the end of the show. After, yeah, let's talk about it, you know? Right. But on stage? Come on. But anyway, so I mean, so everybody, you know, I mean, if it's... They, they don't want to forget it. I think that's probably why he's, you know, he's, he yeah. said something right in the moment. He, he was in the he was in the moment kind of guy. <laughs> anyway, so but um, what a and great story. And I'm not, you know, I'm not dissing him or anything. But that's some some people really do take it to heart, and they really like ah, this was a horrible night. <sighs> Everybody's out there. <sighs> oh man, the worst night ever. Well, I mean, that was like it was like uh, <laughs> Richie Hayward and, and, and Kenny Gradney were going to have a fist fight and. And Bill Payne's like, guys, listen to the crowd, and they're ra roaring. But yeah, yet, yeah. It, your ego's in It's ego, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but, but, yeah. You know, I kind of, I like to think that I go off the crowd's response, even though for me it wasn't the best night, which is kind of interesting because sometimes I feel like I'm having a great night, and the crowd response isn't as good as it is on nights where I'm like, kind of feel like I'm sucking. <laughs> right. I think, I think the the, the well, it's, just, it's so great to hear that. I mean, um, so it goes back and forth, you know. And other times it's like well, doing right it, in the in, line. Doing it, I mean, that, that's bad timing. I mean, what I'm talking about is not even being critical of other people, just being consumed with your own mistakes. I mean, at, at a certain point, it's like yeah. you killed it all for three hours. You can flow. I mean, I just wish people could, could deal in the imperfection. But yeah. I want to tell me, you guys are, I love it. You're road dogging on a tour bus. Is that right? <laughs> Yes, we are. I want to I want to hear a good tour bus story from Tower of Power this trip. Oh man, there are there are too many, probably. <laughs> you know what's what? what's I mean aside from just the colloquial, it's fun to tour on the bus. I mean, you guys are not spring chickens. I mean, and, you know, like I mean, it's so beautiful to see you doing this sort of gut bucket approach. But yeah. um, is there? Is, is it pretty jocular? You know, it's sort of like, you know, that kind of vibe. Well, you know, I wouldn't call it gut bucket. I think it's actually <laughs> gut pretty bucket civilized. Might be the front. You know, I, no, I mean, here, here's gut bucket. Yeah, as, a, as a band, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in an SUV or st old station wagon, calling a U-Haul trailer and staying in motels, you know, totally. that's gut bucket. That's gut, no, exactly. Yeah, so Thank we you. actually yeah. stay in nice places. We do overnight trips like to, uh, um, tomorrow night. Well, tomorrow we're doing an all-day trip. We're doing right. like a six-hour ride. So, and then when we get there, we have that day off. I actually would would have preferred we. I'm not the tour manager. I don't call the shots, and I don't get in his way of that. Mm -hmm. I just let him do it. He, you know, I respect his decision. Um, but I would have rather done it tonight, overnight, and then when we get there, check into our hotel, wake up, day off. You know. Uh, would you, so, you, because, you know, my, my boys in Grateful Shred, they were leaving Chicago at 2 a.m. to get to Cleveland, and they'd have the day off there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we do that. And we, and we do, and we have some of those coming up, and we've already done one uh, so far. And yeah, that El Cajon trip should be done overnight. Yeah. And then you're there tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what that's what I prefer, but... Um, is Garibaldi doing all right on the bus? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, good. I, I, I mean, tell me Everybody a little bit... Everybody is. Doc is, too. Every, everybody's doing well, and... If, and if we if we feel like we need to rest, there's bunks and we can go sleep it off. So, pretty um, civilized, you know. Yeah, I mean, that, no, not, it's not God bucket. We're but, not yeah. in private jets. That you know, that's definitely we're 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 the next level up above gut bucket. You know, and then the level above <laughs> us would be, you know, when we toured with uh, um, Journey, uh, Steve Miller, right, uh, and us. I mean, uh, Journey was doing you know private jet, but. Uh, Steve Miller had his own bus, and then the band had their own bus. And the Steve had Miller had his own he bus. He had his own bus. Yeah, yeah. No, he needed it. Dude. Yeah, yeah. So, and it was, it was wow. he owned the bus. He had his own driver. Wow. And it was a different kind of bus than the rest of the buses, too. It looked different than any other bus I've ever seen. It was painted green, too, which I'd never seen a green bus like that. <laughs> but anyway, I don't, I don't know if he still has it. And then, you know, and then... Santana, you know, I, I know many of the guys in Santana, our, our former lead singer, Ray Green's in Santana. 
and uh, they do a lot of private jet stuff. And uh, nope, they don't do tour buses at all. They are uh, private jets. Um, driving up here today, I listened to you and Brent Midland going at it. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Um, Great band. That was sure fun. Brent Midland, man. I just you know to the world again. Remind us. At that point in his career, you said he was waiting in the wings. He showed up at a rehearsal one day and was like, hey, man, like, can I get in the band? Yeah, you know? yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were a club front, and he like just strolled in? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, Front Street. Yeah, yeah. And that's, the Litchfield Hotel. You were like, this yeah. is San Rafael? Yeah, yeah. It's right next to <laughs> Glitchfield. Yeah. God, that place is, that sign still there. Still there, baby. Like from the 50s. Still man. there. Uh, or early 60s, anyway. I'm not sure exactly why. I'm, wow, I, didn't I cannot believe Marin, that. that but, wow. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we were... Uh, playing in, it was called the Kreutzmann Morgan Band. And before that, I forgot the name of it. it had Kokomo. Kevin, Kokomo, thank you, with Kevin Russell on it. That's right. Great guitar player. At this point, you were just playing as a trio. Uh, n no, we were playing, it was Nate Ginsberg playing keys. Keys. Yeah, and uh, Bill Kreutzmann on drums, Dave Morgan, uh, Alex Ledgerwood, and me. How yeah. long did that go on for? That, like maybe a, a couple tours, and right. then and then we probably were rehearsing it at Front Street, and he heard it and and goes, yeah, "This is this is fun, you know." And at the time, the Grateful Dead were inactive because Jerry was sick. Uh, he had fell fallen into a diabetic coma at one point and was was pretty ill, and then uh, that's when Go Ahead started up. Did you feel? I know one reason. Russell was, I mean, I've interviewed him about it, and, um, you know, the Deadheads didn't take well to his style of, of hard, hard rock. And yeah. I just wonder, uh, regardless of whether you think you met the challenge, I'm not a very objective person, but I think you were freaking great. Did you feel any of that pressure from the Deadheads at all? I, I think the point is that, like, it was evident that the, a change had to be made. It was just too jarring for the, for the, for the, the hippie band. Yeah, you know, I, I don't come from a hair band kind of thing, you know, and Kevin's really, really he's good. He's really good, though. He's really good. He's excellent. You know, he's actually really a good blues player. I mean, yeah. I mean you think of him because he has that he has that Goldilocks rock and roll look, you know. So he has right, the look, but he has right the Right there, that's like, for, the, for a deadhead, that's kind of a, ah, wait a minute. You know? Freaking, dude. Yeah, Freaking yeah. out, dude. I mean, you, you know, know, but looking back, you know, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I didn't wear a leather jacket on stage, you know. I'm, I was, Dave, David and I, Morgan and I, were, we kind of slicked it up. We were wearing bolo ties and nice shirts and <laughs> that's shiny odd. shoes, you know. And that's really not a Grateful Dead approach either. But, you know, they, the Deadheads really did accept us. I, you know, I, I kind of referred to myself as the other Jerry back then. <laughs> the other? Dude, you were the other Jerry, man. <laughs> but what was cool is that a couple years down the road, Garcia... At, uh, was backstage. He, he loved. The, he loved Go Ahead. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, he used to come to our rehearsals. You know. Well, he would. I don't think he made a point to come to our rehearsal. He was. Ju he was just coming to the he would just studio come. to do. You know, conduct some kind of business. We happened to be there. He would take a seat and join us. So that's that's usually what what would happen. And it, then he actually came to our one and only uh, Bay Area gig we played. Yeah, the Conquer gig. Yeah. yeah, that was ill attended because they just didn't pro, uh, you know promote it. So, but yeah, he, he came backstage after, I told you, I think I told you this before, he was in an ill-fitting <laughs> um, velvet suit, <laughs> like this really dark maroon, and he's smoking a cigarette, yeah. and it's like down to the nub, too. Right, going, you always had, hey man, you guys are effing great, man! <laughs> He was like a he was like a jolly Santa Claus. He was really animated, and which, which kind of I was kind of taken aback because when I, whenever I see him on stage, he's really pretty low key, you know. Uh, it's uh, when he so he, when his exuberance so was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But, great uh, guy. <laughs> Jerry, uh, if, yeah. Would, could you close with a Christmas tune? Sure. It was an honor to hear see you, man. Uh, so likewise. Can't wait to yeah. see you play tonight. Thank you. Unrehearsed. Perfect.
This is the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you later.